Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and author of The Rejuvenation Blueprint, which is available for pre-sale now. Today on the podcast, we are discussing fatigue. So Elwin, I know we had a little bit of a discussion about this previously, but why did you want to bring this topic up to our listeners today? Yeah, it's something that I've put off for a while, even though, you know, it's super important. Energy is super important. And I do reference it a lot. I've referenced it in many episodes where we've talked about thyroid and various other issues. Um, so, you know, we'll talk about the basics of energy and fatigue. And then, you know, later we'll also get into, you know, chronic fatigue and maybe uh, long COVID, which seems to be kind of like a version of chronic fatigue. Uh, but we'll start off with just, you know, what is useful and helpful for almost everyone. And I think the reason why it is a little bit complicated is because, first of all, there's myriad reasons. I mean, I, I was just um, being interviewed by a functional medicine doctor the other day, and I said, like, if someone comes into you with generalized fatigue, and I was explaining how the genetics could be helpful, and I said, you know, you could spend over $10,000 on tests to try and find out what's wrong, right? Because there's so many things it could be. That was the point. And she replied and she said, no, no, you could spend hundreds of thousands on tests if you do, like if you don't know what it is, like if you have no clue just on all the things that it could be. So the, the reason I haven't focused it until now is because there are so many things it, you know, potentially could be. But I wanted to address it nonetheless because, of course, it's super important. And I think it's something that is very much under-focused on because a lot of people have it and don't realize because it's so easy to mask the symptoms. Um, I guess it's kind of like, I don't know, headaches. We haven't done one on the headaches yet. And that's because most people, if they have a headache, they just uh, take a painkiller, right? Like it's so simple to mask the symptom and make it go away in most cases. And so with fatigue, it's so simple to mask it and make it go away with a stimulant. Um, but of course, that strategy is something that is not addressing the root cause. And in this podcast, we're all about addressing uh, the root causes. That's what my forthcoming book that you mentioned as well as about, you know, it's the Rejuvenate Blueprint, uh, resolving the seven root causes of all chronic disease. And in fact, just all health issues as well, even though that's not quite the title. <laughs> um, and fatigue is definitely one of them. So yeah, that was the other thing I wanted to do is just give another example. Um, and we might not do it exactly in the order presented in the Rejuvenate Blueprint, because um, all of this is pretty much off the top of my head. But um, we're going to remember to make sure that we do address all seven potential root causes of chronic fatigue, like based on the different categories, um, so that we don't miss anything. Wonderful. Yes, definitely. Looking forward to that book. Can't wait to read it when it comes out, um, especially since the inception and discussing all the steps with you. That was quite an eye opener. And I know we've been sharing that with our listeners around. So you, there's a couple other episodes on the podcast. So please do check those out. Um, and so let's just dive in. What is fatigue? You know, are there different types of fa fatigue? And how does somebody know if they have it or they're just tired? Yeah, fatigue, exhaustion, tiredness. Well, you say just tired. So I suppose just tired means that you just should be going to bed, right? That's probably the distinction there. Um, and that you haven't had enough sleep. So I suppose um, that is the distinction there. <clears throat> but it's a tricky distinction because, you know, I, I've experienced this over and over with clients where they don't, you know, it wouldn't have occurred to them that's the case. They're getting maybe seven hours of very interrupted sleep or they're only getting five to six hours of sleep a night and they've been functioning that way for you know years maybe sometimes decades and so when you know fatigue and many other health issues does hit them uh they're not making that connection of am i just tired and it's kind of not just when you're working on such a, a sleep deficit um i know that the guy who um someone asked me to do a reaction to video to him i might start doing those that's a quite a good idea chrissy um, what's his name? Brian something. Oh, Brian Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Johnson. Um, you know, I just saw a post of his where he said for health, he believed sleep was number one, exercise is number two, and diet was number three. And I thought that's very interesting. So, um, you know, how often is it just, just a lack of sleep? You know, reasonably often. But I would go deeper on that, which is, sure, some people are not sleeping because they are just 
forcing themselves to not because they believe that sleep is for the weak and you know sleep is a waste yeah, of time. That old adage, kind of I stuff. only got two hours of sleep, I'm working <laughs> through it. Oh yeah, something to it, but yeah, no, not so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people believe that and uh, that's only really shifted even in the health world in the last mm, 10, 15 years, something like that. I think not long ago, uh, pretty much everyone was agreed that you know, that um, maybe sleeping less is, is good if you can get away with it kind of thing. I think the benefits of sleep have only really been mainstreamed, even the well, alternative mainstreamed in the last, <laughs> as I said, decade or so, um, so that most of us understand it now that you're not going to be optimal if you don't sleep enough. And yes, there is that rare variation of people who genuinely are fine on five to six hours sleep. And, you know, that quite often they do become famous people or powerful people or influential people or whatever you might call it because it does give you a distinct advantage as there are many things that give you a distinct advantage in life and that is one of them and if you have several more hours in a day then that's great good you know good for you but there is a small minority genetically who have that ability to really thrive and be genuinely fine there's a much greater percentage of people who think that they're that person <laughs> um, but they develop all sorts of problems over time so again you know that's where it's helpful to check your genetics with a service like Genetic Insights. Just see if you are one of those people who really does totally fine with, you know, significantly less sleep. So, yeah, you know, back to your question, is it just tiredness? Is it just lack of sleep? Um, that definitely can be a factor. But, of course, if the lack of sleep has been going on for a long, long time, that may well have created a bunch of other problems that simply now trying to sleep hours, eight hours a night is not going to, you know, address and resolve. So... Um, yeah, but yeah, sleep is a good starting point and we've really done an episode on sleep and you know, the other thing I'd say about sleep, yeah, so I didn't quite finish that for that. Okay. Some people are not sleeping because they not sleeping enough because they believe that, you know, sleep is a waste of time and all that kind of stuff. But I would say more commonly people are not sleeping because there's a problem. There's something stopping them sleeping. Probably chronic stress would be the number one thing, but there's a load of different things that can potentially cause that. And you know, again, we addressed that in that episode that we really did. So I won't talk much about sleep in this episode because it's very obvious and because we already addressed it. I'm going to look more at like you are getting enough sleep now and you're still feeling fatigued. And so what else is wrong? And going back to the beginning as well, like defining fatigue and are there different types of fatigue? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's not something that is, you know, super well defined, I would say, in the you know, mainstream medical literature. Um, fatigue is simply a lack of energy, I would say. Um, you know, chronic fatigue is simply where there is a consistent <laughs> lack of energy. Uh, it's a medical diagnosis that not all medical doctors, you know, acknowledge as, as being real, which is a shame because I am convinced that there is a very real and measurable mitochondrial basis for it and also very commonly other hormonal basis and all the rest of it but it's something that very much can be evaluated and can be seen in fact we are going to get into the the thick of it we, we've got a, an image there on the mitochondria and stuff and how it works that we will get into in a bit so uh yeah it's it's a very real thing um but i suppose the distinction would be what's considered a normal amount of fatigue that, you know, maybe the majority of the population has because of, you know, lifestyle and stress and everything is where when you take a stimulant, you still have enough energy to function. And what's considered an aberrant level of fatigue is where even when you take stimulants, it still is not enough to allow you to function. And that usually is the level of fatigue at which a person will finally go, huh, maybe there's a problem here that I actually need to address. And that is unfortunate. And I, I was one of those people, please don't think I'm mocking anyone, I'm mocking myself. Um, but that is unfortunate because by the time you've got to that stage where you are so um, fatigued that even stimulants don't do anything anymore or don't do enough to allow you to function anymore, that means that you're already pretty far along the track of depletion and so i just use that word there depletion that's something that i very much um associate with fatigue and i think it's for anyone who has fatigue they can very much relate to that feeling so if your whole life is kind of based around 
like scarcity and lack of energy to do stuff. Um, oh God, you know, I, 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 like when you have that, you become very good at efficiency. You focus a lot on efficiency. Like you don't waste energy. You don't waste time because you know you have such a limited amount of it. And if that is part of your operating procedure, if you're always like calculating, am I going to have enough energy for this? If I go and do this, if I, you know, if I commit to this shift at work, if I commit to this social gathering, if I, whatever, then am I going to be able to cope with that? Am I going to have enough energy or am I going to be too tired? Then that would be like early warning signs. An earlier warning sign, which as I said, almost everyone is here is, I'm not going to be able to function doing this unless I have a stimulant. Mm, but unfortunately, okay. that is a level of fatigue that is, um, you know, ubiquitous and not fully understood, even though that's, you know, not a good thing. Now, I know that some people watching this are a fan of stimulants. They think that they're good. And so I'm actually not 100% against that. I think there are some types of people and sometimes of metabolism, sometimes of genetics and all the rest of it where stimulants are at the very least fine maybe beneficial but the point i'm making is more um if you ne if you need something in order to function relying you, on it yeah if you need something in order to do basic things then that is a sign that there is a problem so if you're like oh you know i love my coffee it makes me feel better why would i stop that's fine um but try stopping for a few days. If you get headaches and you know all, all these kind of symptoms, that's withdrawal. That's a so that means that you're a drug addict, basically. Even if you know it's a very harmless drug compared to most. Um, and if you also maybe you don't have the withdrawal symptoms, but you just feel fatigue, you just can't function, you just can't do what you normally do. That's another sign that you are not uh, running on your own energy. You're running on adrenal energy and so this is a distinction i learned a long time ago and i've taught for a long time back in since you know 2010 something like that um this concept that i got from eastern medicine which um even though i don't use the terminology anymore i still think it's a hundred percent accurate and I, I can give the you know western scientific equivalence so you know from that eastern Taoist perspective they talk about there's, there's basically three types of energy but the two that we're focused on today is so there's chi which is what they would call your uh, you're just your life force energy, um, which I sometimes used to refer to as everyday energy. And then there's your jing, or sometimes called ching chi, which is like your reserves of energy. And the idea is that your chi comes from, literally in Eastern medicine, it comes from um, uh, breath and food. And, you know, so the <laughs> scientific equivalent of that is oxygen, uh, which requires carbon dioxide. We'll get to that. And then, um, you know, glucose and all the other, you know, nutrients, the, the cofactors that are required, uh, which creates ATP. So chi and ATP, I really consider, you know, very similar, conterminous. And then the reserves of energy. So what they teach is every time you dig into your reserves, you will often feel good, uh, but it's a limited resource. It's something that the more that you have to dip into your reserves, the more drained you will be and the more you will accelerate the process of aging. And so the equivalent of that to me is uh, your adrenal energy. So this is high levels of uh, adrenaline, high levels of noradrenaline, high levels of cortisol, uh, you know, and other less known factors as well. So is there any truth to this concept from a Western scientific point of view? Well, yes, there is, because when your um, adrenal chemicals are elevated, your body absolutely does speed up your metabolism anyway. Um, it will break down fat, which some people consider is desirable, but also, you know, there's fat everywhere, even in the brain, there's fat all over in places that you want it, um, and it will break down muscle tissue and it will um, deplete your muscles of glycogen, so reserves. So it will break down carbohydrates in reserve in the muscles in the liver. It will break down the muscles themselves to free up amino acids. It will break down fat to free up uh, free fatty acids. And it will also uh, use up and uh, even more of the cofactors, which you may, like magnesium and B vitamins and all the kind of stuff we talk about a lot, which you may already be low in, which may be causing your fatigue in the first place. So 
is this Eastern idea of you are draining yourself by using this reserve energy accurate? Maybe not in the sense that it's reserve accurate, but in the sense that like in a functional empirical sense that if you keep not having enough ATP and you keep stimulating adrenaline in order to function, does that end up depleting you of important nutrients that you need to function optimally? I would say the answer is, you know, absolutely yes. And that's why it's always better to address this issue sooner than later. So does that answer your original question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it does. It's also giving the wider concept too, which I love about, you know, going into what, you know, chi, ATP and reserves, because we know if there's not enough gas in the tank, you're not going to go very far. And we, many of us today are really pushing ourselves beyond certain limits. And, um, you mentioned something about stimulants because I was going to ask you as well, you know, are there certain symptoms that people can look to, I look for to identify whether they have fatigue? Um, you mentioned that one, if they're relying on stimulants to help get them through to where they need to go to, uh, is there anything else in that way that somebody could be looking for to identify this? Yeah. Uh, I mean, lack of physical energy. So, you know, literally not wanting to get up, not wanting to exercise and move, I think I've talked about this before. I certainly do in a lot of other people's podcasts. When people don't want to exercise and other people say it's laziness or people often say that about themselves, oh, I'm too lazy to go to the gym or whatever. Like that's not laziness. Like if if you see someone who is unwilling to eat, like they, and they're like, oh, I just don't want to eat. Like do you say to them, you're so lazy, God, just eat. Like you wouldn't say that, would you? Because like eating is not something that requires – that should require willpower. And so if a person doesn't want to do it, if they don't feel like doing it, it's a sign of a real problem. Um, and, you know, if your child, for instance, didn't want to eat, you, you, know, you might go to the doctor or whatever, right? Like, what's wrong with them? So, you, but again, you think that there's something wrong, like an illness or something. Now, if someone doesn't want to move, if someone doesn't want to exercise, why are we calling that laziness? Or why are we saying that about ourselves? It's the same thing. You can see with healthy children, like the difficult thing is to get them to stay still, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not moving. <laughs> and some of them manage it, you know, like they're, again, those Taoist training and Buddhist monk training, all the rest in the East where they manage to train these children to be extremely disciplined and sit still for hours and all the rest of it. But that is an achievement, right? Like it's, it's an achievement to sit still as a child because you have so much energy. So... Um, the idea that, so yeah, not wanting to exercise, not wanting to move would be a class. And again, wanting to, like forcing yourself to get up, up out of the sofa and go to the gym because you don't want to become fat or whatever it might be. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm saying like just this desire to move your body should be very much intrinsic in something that you want to do throughout the day. I think the longest I ever sit down, Chrissy, is probably when we do these interviews. Like usually even when I'm on calls with people, I'm like, I try and, uh, you know, I, I'm moving around and walking around while I wear headphones and stuff because I want to move. It feels more enjoyable to move. And so I think that's completely natural. Yeah, I'm quite um, envious of you doing your walking meetings because I'm a, such a note taker. I'm like, God, how could I how could I step and take notes at the same time while I do meetings? But no, that's brilliant. Yeah, you are always on the go. <laughs> well, if nothing else, like uh, you can do it while you're talking, right? And then as soon as you're back to listening, you can sit down and, and yeah. write again. Sometimes I do have to sit and write something in between. But when I'm talking, I move. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, so that's a, that's another sign. Uh, another one I think that I, I've been talking about recently, which I know, again, is controversial to this particular health world or some aspects of it, is um, the whole relationship that you have to food. And so, I mean, I talked about taking a stimulant to give like fa fake artificial energy but waking up in the morning and not eating for several hours, even if you don't take any kind of stimulant, is really the same thing. Like it will it will spike adrenaline and cortisol and noradrenaline, and it will have the same effect, um, pr pretty much identical. So it, now, again, if you're doing that for a certain reason, you're very healthy, you're very robust, it doesn't slow down your metabolism. We'll talk about that later. I'm not saying it's always bad. There are health benefits to fasting. Although I'm suspicious of people who like prefer to do it in the morning because really the better time to fast is at the end of the day, not the beginning of the day, if it's actually for the health benefits that uh, uh, fasting is usually touted for. If, if it's intermittent fasting, sure, if you're fasting all day, then fair enough. Um, but my point is, 
like an early warning sign of fatigue. I think that was the original question. Um, food should give you energy. If you feel energized from not eating and you feel less energized after eating, that is a classic indicator that you are running on stress. You may not even be artificially stimulating stress hormones with uh, stimulants, but you are still running on stress. Because if you think about it, everyone, everyone learned this in basic high school or whatever middle school biology class, right? Where does energy come from? Energy comes from the food you eat. That's usually the thing that everyone remembers. It also comes from the air you breathe, you know, fair enough. So why would not eating, why would skipping a meal make you feel more unenergized? Now, for some people say, oh, it's because my digestion is so bad. Well, fair enough. So does that really bring in the whole conversation of having the right microbial gut health and where that could be with bringing in the question of whether somebody's digestion is really poorly and their ability to digest certain foods or eating the right foods, as we've talked about with the feel younger diet, et cetera, and things like that? Uh, yeah, it could be. Yeah, I mean, and so that's you know one of the six potential, uh, one of the seven potential you know root causes of everything, including fatigue, is uh, chronic infections, right? So absolutely, a chronic infection in the gut could mean that you feel less energy after eating, and so therefore you're going to want to avoid eating. That's absolutely was my experience for a long time, so I can 100 percent relate and understand that. But I'm just saying it's a sign of a problem, you know, something that needs to be addressed as opposed to something that you override by fasting or taking stimulants or whatever it might be. Or taking you, some over-the-counter medicine to like, oh, let's, let's sort that out later. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes uh, if the medicine actually resolves the root cause, then I'm not necessarily against it. But uh, yeah, my my point is really that like fasting or taking stimulants as a way of having energy is not resolving the root cause. I guess that's the point. And and the, the, the tendency to do those things, to feel energy, is a sign of fatigue that you may not be acknowledging, to go back to your original question. Yes. No, those are great. So really looking at that, okay, if there's somebody that just can't quite get to the gym, can't exercise, even though that that's good for them, um, you know, if, if, you know, not eating can't is giving sleep. you more... Yeah, can't sleep. If not eating is giving you more energy than when you do eat, um, things like that. Or if you're using stimulants or things like that to also help you get through the day, those are things that we should really be looking at. Yeah, uh, and I would say <clears throat> if you do not use any stimulants, if you eat, you know, regularly and in a what would I say, uh, you know, healthy way, normal way, in a way that doesn't massively affect your weight in either direction. Um, and you feel like you have energy throughout the day until nighttime where it's normal to not, then you probably don't have a problem with fatigue. But how many people fit into that category, right? Unfortunately, most people don't. Yeah, no, absolutely. Perfect. Okay, so great signs and symptoms for everybody to look for because a lot of people oh, out there do... Sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. Go Just ahead. one more. Like, uh, You should feel energy within five minutes of waking up. You know, like If you're groggy for ages and, again, you need to take a coffee or even, you know, there's the whole thing about go outside and get some direct sunlight in your eyes to stimulate cortisol and all that kind of stuff. All of that's good, um, but I still think, you know, from my experience of having been both, that, uh, that you know, just within a few minutes waking up, your body should naturally raise the cortisol. Uh, your body should naturally, um, you know, speed up the metabolism and all the rest of it enough that you don't feel groggy and like low in energy for a while. You shouldn't have to do something to energize yourself when you wake up. I guess that's the point. It should just be natural if you are not fatigued. Genetic Insights provides cutting edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, 
weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Great addition, great addition. I was gonna say because as well, many people say, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I don't have any energy. There's a lot out there about chronic fatigue and trying to understand it. So what does cause a fatigue to be chronic and how does someone know when it's becoming a serious issue and it needs attention? When should somebody really start to focus on this? Yeah, so I think what causes the fatigue to be chronic is, you know, a few different things. Um, I mean, I'll give a more detailed answer when we go into all the root causes, but on a simple level, it's doing everything I just said. It's ignoring it, <laughs> ignoring the root causes, uh, doing strategies that don't address the root cause to try and get carry on with your life and get through the day and get through the week and whatever it may be. Um, now, you know, it could be other things. Obviously, it could be genetic factors. It could be, all, you know, all the stuff that we're going to talk about. But the thing that usually makes it get chronic from what I've, look, I've actually, because I wrote a book about this in 2010, which honestly, I would not recommend anymore. I've learned so much since then, but I did. So I spoke to a lot of people for a few years who had chronic fatigue. And uh, even though sometimes they thought it did, it never came out of the blue. It came out like always these were people who, uh, for usually years and years and years, pushed themselves very, very hard, um, did not listen to their own body, acted like they were limitless, like they were superman or superwoman, um, you know, sometimes for very, very benevolent reasons, like they were, you know, always looking after everyone around them or they wanted to achieve something very, you know, beneficial for the world and all the rest of it. I... I don't think I ever met like an evil chronic fatiguer. They were always <laughs> like very benevolent people who, uh, you know, really cared, really cared about making the world a better place, really cared about other people. Um, but To their detriment in a way. Yeah, really. And there is a psychological aspect to it. And that is, you know, one of my seven steps as well that, you know, we might, we'll hopefully get to that as well. But um, anyway, the point is it, it, <laughs> it takes a lot of ignoring the signs and ignoring the root causes to get to chronic fatigue from my experience. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's time for us to really pay attention and listen if we want to have that optimization and longevity that we really want to, as we, how can I say this, you know, gracefully mature into the length of our life. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You mentioned earlier about adrenals because adrenal burnout is something that's bandied about quite a lot. And I just want to know, is that the same thing as fatigue? Is adrenal, adrenal burnout its own thing? Is it separate? Uh, if you can elaborate, that'd be great. Well, there's a term called adrenal fatigue, right? Which was, uh, you know, invented by a doctor, I think about 20 years ago, and, you know, who wrote a book about it. Um, and it is very much uh, quite popular in the alternative health world, I think less so now than it was, and very much dismissed by almost everyone in the mainstream medical and scientific community. And honestly, I think for like some good reason, the, the thing that they don't like about it is that it's technically inaccurate. Now, that's not to say if you, 
you know, have were diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, you got a bunch of recommendations, they made you feel better. I'm not undermining any of that, but all I'm saying is that it it's pretty rare that adrenals running out of energy is actually the problem, which is kind of what you would expect with the term adrenal fatigue. What it probably actually is, is fatigue of you know, the, the mitochondria inside your cells, for instance, which is what we're going to get into soon. If we're going to talk about glands, then it's much more likely to be thyroid fatigue, for instance, where the thyroid cannot keep up with hormone production in order to provide sufficient energy. But usually, except for in extreme cases like Addison's, um, which is way less than 1% of the population. Can you tell us what Addison's is? Yeah, so Addison's is uh, you know, genuine from a medical point of view, adrenal insufficiency. It's where your adrenal glands are so diseased, dysfunctional, whatever you might want to call it, for various different reasons, um, that it, they actually cannot produce enough adrenal hormones. They can't produce enough DHEA, they can't produce enough cortisol, they can't produce enough adrenaline, they can't produce enough noradrenaline, um, they can't produce what's necessary. And so that's Addison's, that's kind of a genuine adrenal fatigue, but it's very rare and it's very obvious doing blood tests um, that that is something that you have. And in that case, the person is supplemented with adrenal hormones because they can't make their own. It just in the sense that, you know, a hypothyroid person is supplemented with thyroid hormones because they can't make their own. But it's much, much, much less rare than hypothyroidism. And it's also, from my perspective, much, much further along the path of fatigue as hypothyroidism. So the thyroid kind of becomes fatigued or, you know, maybe mainstream medicine would like that term either, but like down-regulates its production of thyroid hormone. That's really more accurate as well, way before the adrenals do in most cases. So, uh, you know, we had Dr. Platt on here a while ago and he talked about how he didn't believe in adrenal fatigue, even though he'd helped a lot of people who might have been diagnosed with it. He said it's, it's actually adrenal excess and that's much more you know, where I would land on it as well. It's actually that there is a fatigue of, you know, for whatever reason, we're going to get into all those reasons. There's a lack of mitochondrial energy and your adrenals are the thing keeping you going. And sometimes it's a bit up and down. So there's sometimes it's like, a, you know, you do feel energized and you feel anxious and um, jittery and all that kind of stuff and the next minute you're exhausted and you can't get out of bed and you can't keep your eyes open all the rest of it so that's what that can happen when the adrenals are kind of the only thing keeping you going and so then it's kind of uh but again it's the the fatigue is not coming from the adrenals being out of energy the fatigue is coming from the mitochondria not producing enough energy and your adrenals having to try to keep you going that's my understanding okay. Yeah, so what I'm really hearing is that fatigue is really coming from mitochondrial function here, not having enough. Yes, that's my understanding. And, the, you know, there's mainstream science as well. There is kind of non-mainstream science, which I'm digging into about the role of, uh, you know, biophotons and melanin, all this kind of stuff. And I'm, I think I, I'm trying to get a, a range an interview with someone who is an expert on that to come on and they can explain their perspective on that because there is a fringe but growing part of science that actually believes that like uh that aspect is more important than mainstream science currently realizes and atp is maybe less important than it's currently realized but still from a practical point of view as i say you know i i, I deal with a company who um who does mitochondrial testing and they get people with chronic fatigue sending in their blood all the time and it always shows like low mitochondrial functioning. So again, while there may be more to it than that, that's definitely a significant part of it. And it's definitely a case that if you support the mitochondria, then the person will have more energy. So that's really is the root of it. Yeah. And there's you know obvious stuff, which is obvious to anyone who's listened to a lot of this podcast anyway, of like uh, looking at thyroid function, but there's a lot of less obvious stuff as well that we'll get into. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned tests. So that's where I want to go next. Where, or are there a certain tests or tests that you recommend for people to, or who want to test for fatigue and see if they have it? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the simplest thing is probably hormones to start with. So adrenal, thyroid, and sex hormones. The typical pattern that you see with someone with fatigue is, um, low levels of thyroid function, you know, indicated by low 3T3, high TSH, although 
this can vary as we talked about in our Wilson's episode and anyone with fatigue, I do recommend you watch our Wilson's episode because that's um, still, I would say the go-to intervention I recommend for anyone whose thyroid is not optimal. Um, you also tend to see um, a higher ratio of cortisol to DHEA. You don't always see high cortisol, but you see the, you know, the DHEA goes low in most cases. Um, you see that the sex hormones, testosterone tends to go down in men, progesterone tends to go down in women. Um, so these are like some obvious signs and sometimes working on that level, just of the hormones is enough. And in fact, often, especially in the case of thyroid, it, in terms of the person's perception of energy, uh, especially for men, you know, if you have a man who's low thyroid, low testosterone, you get them uh, to have optimal levels of that with either supplementation or, um, you know, other strategies and they'll bounce right back again. They'll feel great in a lot of cases. And that's because there is this correlation. So we go back to that Eastern thing I said, where they, they talk about this jing energy, which gets depleted and makes you accelerate your aging. So there is this correlation between when your body's in a highly adrenalized mode, then there's kind of less resource available to create, um, other hormones, especially like the sex hormones, DHEA, testosterone, and progesterone would be the main thing I'd focus on. And so a person can uh, feel worse um, when those are low and they feel substantially better when those are raised again. Now, in the case of testosterone and DHEA and progesterone, it's not really resolving the root problem directly. It could help a lot indirectly, though for all kinds of complex reasons that may become clear. Um, in the case of thyroid, it can directly help because the thyroid is literally the hormone, the number one hormone, the main hormone that tells your mitochondria to produce more energy. So a lot of the time, a lack of energy is as simple as that. It is as simple as, uh, for many reasons, and I won't go into all of them because we talked about it already in previous episodes, like the Wilson's one, your body has decided to down regulate or has had no choice but to down regulate the signal to your mitochondria to produce more energy so in those cases it's not that your mitochondria are not capable of producing more energy it's just that they're not getting the signal to produce more energy and so the easiest thing to start with and so back to your test question look into that see that if if all that is needed is just the signal in the many many cases that actually is all that's needed um in many also other cases, it's not all that's needed, but it's still an important step. So it's definitely something that's worth getting into. Now, you can actually test mitochondrial function. Uh, this is a test that I had done. And I'm glad that I did because it really kind of showed like why I was still not optimal, uh, even though every other test I got just seemed to say that I really didn't have any health problems. You may, it was a bit like a hypochondriac. I'm like, Look at these. What about these test results? And I'm like, oh, it looks pretty optimal to me. And like, what about these tests? It looks pretty optimal to me. And like, really? Huh. And then eventually, it was like, oh, the mitochondria are not uh, doing a great job of producing energy. And then we, um, I can't actually remember the name of it. We'll have to put it afterwards. Uh, we'll put it afterwards. But it's only available through a doctor anyway. So this is something I ordered through Doctor Miriam. Um, you know. Diff you're, you're, you can reach out to Dr. Miriam if you're not in the UK or Europe and she might be able to organize it for you anyway, depending on where you are or, you know, refer you to someone. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, you know. Well, that was quite telling then, I guess, when you got the results back to go, no wonder. Okay, there's an answer here. There's something that I've just discovered. Yeah, very much so. And then, you know, investigating because the thyroid is okay now and the metabolism is okay you know i'm a very consistent 37 degrees and all that kind of stuff and so you know looking into it basically it's still that lead poisoning it looks like uh we have not been able to find anything else and it's so obvious and you look into it like does lead have that impact on um the impact that was seen in my tests anyway on mitochondrial function, the answer was very much yes. So it's like, okay. So it looks like that's still the issue unless, you know, something else is also discovered. Um, and yeah, that's just something, unfortunately, that's very slow to get out of your cells once you have that very high level that I do. 
Um, but that was it for me. So for me, you know, the seven steps to my rejuvenate blueprint, for me, it looks like the root, root cause of my health issues um, in terms of being like the hardest thing to address and the thing that like wasn't resolved when everything else was resolved is the toxicity. But for different people, it's different things. And that's why all seven are worth considering because just because that's what it is for me, doesn't mean that's what it is for you watching, you know, for you, it may well be something different. Although I do agree with, you know, Dr. Smith, who's been on there a couple of times, that it is actually often when you really get down to it, uh, a toxicity issue fundamentally, although I don't believe it is always. Um, but of course, a person, even if it is fundamentally a toxicity issue, and even if the toxin is very difficult and slow to uh, completely remove from the cells, you can still help a person feel a lot better by working on some of the other root causes and I you know I personally did have other root causes as well so yeah to go back to your original question um testing I would start with the hormonal stuff I would also start with I mean we're going to talk about all different root causes all of these root causes there are tests for you know so like test anything and everything that you can that you think there's a good chance that this could be a root cause for you but yeah like most obvious starting place is hormones and most obvious end point if nothing else <laughs> explains it is the mitochondria you could, i suppose you could start with the mitochondria straight away if the practitioner is amenable to that but even in that case it only tells you how well your mitochondria is functioning it still doesn't explain why so you'd still have to do the other tests to look right, into right, right. What, what is it okay all right yeah that's a really great point there it can tell you whether it's uh, functioning well or not very well but then you've got to figure out now why and that's i think as well where your rejuvenation blueprint comes in as we've discussed before in previous episodes but that leads me into this next question which really is what what causes fatigue great <laughs> well let's go through it, the list right so seven steps seven root causes so the first one i always look at is genetics and i look at genetics first of all you know there is a fatigue report uh, some people just are more prone to this. Um, and in that report, it will also talk about, you know, which genes may be raising the risk for you. If you do have an elevated risk, that can also give you some clues. And of course, it gives some recommendations. So that's like a really obvious starting place. Um, however, beyond that, I would also look at the genetics of the other, uh, you know, five or six things that we're about to talk about. Um, to see if they would be worth investigating further. So what does that mean? Maybe that sounds a bit abstract. I'll give an example with the next one. So number two. Uh, so number two is the building blocks, right? It's the um, the things that we are built out of. And so um, there are various building blocks that you may be deficient in, which may be causing fatigue. This is like, it can get ridiculously complex, but this is a reasonably complex, but I hope still just about understandable uh, map of how the body produces energy. So uh, just for those that are just listening, we're actually looking at a, um, a diagram of the citric acid cycle for you that are uh, just purely on audio. Yes. Uh, that's the name of it. I mean, but it also shows the electron transport chain and like the conversion of um uh, the calorie containing nutrients into uh, acetyl CoA. Um, so maybe we'll talk about every aspect at some point, but for now I just want to highlight a couple of things. So you can see the, at the top, right at the top here, we got fatty acids, carbohydrates, and proteins. Those are the three basic uh, calorie containing nutrients, right? There is also alcohol, but it's not on here. And you know, uh, I believe that the metabolism is pretty much the same as the carbohydrates, so we treat it the same way. Okay, so these are the three calorie containing nutrients. And we can see that through various processes, they all end up being the same thing, which is this acetyl CoA. Um, and then from there, it doesn't really like describe this fully in here, but um, it, it can then be turned um, straight into ATP. Um, it can go through this citric acid cycle and then it can also uh, go into this electron transport chain. And what we ideally want is for it to go, it as in a unit of uh, energy, a calorie, a unit of glucose, we want it to go through this full system to be able to extract the maximum amount of energy um, from this unit of food in tra to transform it into as much ATP as possible. And the only thing I want to bring to your attention right now is, um, do you see kind of in between all the big things, there's like little 
green arrows pointing and there's little um, like abbreviated symbols next to them. So right at the top here, we have fatty acids going to beta oxidation and you can see there it says Mg and B2. And so what that means is for in order for that process to happen, for fats to go through the process where they can then go into the basic substrate of energy, magnesium and vitamin B2 are required. And you can see there's a similar thing there for converting magnesium to pyruvate, and there's another one there. And so you can see just in terms of these processes described here, which is not an exhaustive list, um, there are nutrients magnesium, vitamin B1, B2, B3, B5, alpha lipoic acid, iron, uh, glutathione, uh, manganese, uh, B3, did I say that? Yeah, uh, coenzyme Q10. So those are cofactors for these reactions. And so why am I bringing this up? Because if you have a suboptimal level of any of those cofactors I just mentioned, or in fact more, I'm just highlighting the ones that are made obvious through you know, the parts of the process that's highlighted in this particular diagram, a lack of or um, a suboptimal amount of any of those cofactors can slow the whole process down. If it's a lack, you know, a sufficient enough lack, it can grind it to a halt. Now, out of all the ones I just said, uh, let's see, alpha lipoic acid and glutathione, your body can make its own out of other nutrients. Every other thing I said, though, your body can't make itself. That's what makes it a vitamin. That's what makes it a mineral um, is that your body cannot make its own. So it requires it from the outside. It requires it from diet or it requires you to have sufficient stores or reserves of that nutrient available in order to make that process happen. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes absolute sense. Okay. And you can see, you know, this is why I often say magnesium and B vitamins, you can see like a theme there that they're very important. Iron too, you know, and that's uh, iron um, is, you know, usually thought of as the thing that transports oxygen, which is a super important part of this process that is not described in this diagram. But you can see it's actually, you know, required for a bunch of other processes as well, which are essential for uh, creating energy. So if you lack any of the cofactors for energy production, which is really indirectly and directly every nutrient. And then um, if you're talking about directly the majority of nutrients, then that can long term create fatigue. And I just want to highlight that it can be as simple as that. Now, is it always? No. But is it more often than you might think, especially if you have a mainstream medical perspective? Yes from my point of view, like it, it can be as simple as just magnesium or just zinc, which is not in this picture or whatever, uh, just B3 can make a massive difference to someone's health, uh, their level of energy for this reason. And so back to us talking about genetics, I would look at someone's genetics and if I see that they have, for instance, an elevated need for a certain nutrient, like I think you and I both do for B3, for instance, um, Chrissy, and then I would look at their diet. And if they ha have and have for a long time had a deficiency of that nutrient in their diet. Now, actually, the body can make B3 out of tryptophan, which is an amino acid, but there's not a huge amount of tryptophan in most diets, and it's a very inefficient process. So um, it's certainly in terms of having an optimal amount, it's very hard to have that if we're not getting enough from our diet. And so that can be potentially a root cause. And there are people who take like high dose niacin, for instance, which is vitamin B3, and they feel masses better, <laughs> like it's all they needed. And it's the same for magnesium, and it's the same for iron. I, I had a client with iron. They had an increased genetic need for iron. Um, they tested it, their iron was low. B12 actually was another one, again, not on this list, but really also part of this energy producing process, uh, just happens to not be on this diagram. And all they did is start taking iron and uh, B12 and their MS went away and they lost 40 pounds of being overweight to being back to a weight that they were happy with and their fatigue went away and all these problems. And they hadn't even followed any other advice. They hadn't gone and checked the hormones. They hadn't done this. They certainly hadn't checked the mitochondria. All they did is to, <laughs> took a couple of nutrients um, and, you know, everything was resolved. Now, 
it, is it always that simple? No, but it can be. And so that's why I encourage people, uh, get the genetic test, find out if you have an increased need for these nutrients, look at your nutritional intake. You can use you know, one of those apps like a chronometer or something like that and see, um, you know, with your average daily diet, what you're actually taking in, look at your supplements as well, if you take any, and then, you know, make that calculation. Now, that's in terms of deficiency. The reality as well is that sometimes, even if you don't have deficiency, taking more of a certain nutrient can help to optimize the process anyway by speeding up some of these processes. Uh, B1 is an example of that, um, of that uh, conversion of uh, pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA. You can see that here. Um, uh, magnesium is an example of that. B3 is an example of that. B2 is an example of that, and it's all pretty harmless. I would not take large amounts of iron because iron is a heavy metal, and it's just as bad having too much as too little. But for some of the nutrients, at least, some of the nutrients listed here, it can, even if you don't have deficiency, it can still make you better to have more because it can help to speed up some of these enzymes. It's kind of almost like kickstarting the process and, and getting things moving. So that's why sometimes some practitioners will recommend high doses of these things, even if you're doing okay. So that's how nutrients or building blocks can make a big difference. Now, it's not on the image that we were sharing, but another essential nutrient that I just want to mention when we talk about energy um, is carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide, along with things like iron and B12, are essential for getting oxygen from your blood, red blood cells, where they go just by the act of breathing, into the mitochondria. It's essential to have carbon dioxide for that. And to go back to that whole, do you really have energy or are you stressed question that I probably spent too long talking about in the intro, um, the more you are running on stress, taking stimulants, fasting, all of that kind of stuff, the more that you will be intolerant to carbon dioxide. The more stress you have, the more your body perceives carbon dioxide as being excessive and will cause you to breathe more to get rid of it. The problem is, the more that that happens, the less carbon dioxide you have, the more, the less oxygen you're gonna be able to transport to your mitochondria, and so it can easily become a vicious circle, which may have started with you know, one thing, some traumatic incident, some kind of, you know, I had to work 16 hour shifts for a few months, some kind of, uh, you know, I had to look after my baby 24 hours a day and barely slept, like any of these kind of things. And then afterwards, everything goes back to normal and now that your child's at school or now you're working normal hours again or now the traumatic situation is long gone or, you know, whatever, but you're still running on stress and it's very hard to get out of that loop because you keep blowing off too much carbon dioxide, which means that not enough oxygen is getting to the mitochondria, which means, and um, I didn't prepare an image for this, Chrissy, but maybe we can find one and add it after, that your body goes more to the inefficient way of um, producing energy, which is glycolysis, at, at, and which has a... Um, uh, like a lactic acid as a but uh, as a byproduct rather than the more efficient way of producing energy which produces a lot more energy which is this oxidative phosphorylation which is what is described in the uh, the diagram that I came prepared with um so co2 is another big one and we have a whole episode on that I, if that was like huh, what is he talking about you got to watch the whole episode because it takes a while to explain but that's just a quick reminder for anyone who has watched it but kind of half forgotten it um that can like so co2 is a really important nutrient as well unfortunately we don't have a report on that um in genetic insights but whatever it's still something that you uh you really want to be aware of so uh yeah nutrients can be big nutrients i know when we first really were discussing the rejuvenation blueprint that was one of the things that it it was like, it could be as simple as this. And if it is amazing. And it just by also showing that diagram that you just, that we had, uh, that it's been up, you actually realize, oh my goodness, there's so, these cofactors, if you don't have enough, no wonder. No wonder your body's not able to do that and you're already behind. So it's a very, very, very important factor. And I think as well, like you said, both of us are, um, our genetics were, we're, potentially low in B3. So it's very important that we supplement with that. So as you can see on that diagram, how important it is, it is as a cofactor for so many of these processes.
Yeah, or get plenty from diet at least. You know, I know some people hate the word supplement. And we've talked about that before, but okay. So if you really hate supplements, fine. But then make sure you get enough for you from the diet and test to make sure you're getting enough, especially if they have that genetic tendency uh, to be low in it. And yeah, often supplementing is easier, but if you're a purist, go for it, but just make sure you get it one way or another. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the next root cause, Chrissy, and um, I will go back to that one because when you... We're going to talk about practical things to help people, but I just want to talk about the root causes first. Uh, so I will talk about some, you know, what are my top nutrients or whatever for fatigue. But let's just talk about the other root causes. Um, so the other thing, if we go back to this diagram referring to it, you also see, and again, this is certainly not exhaustive. There's others that I'm aware of, but it's just an example how there's these red circles with like pointy arrows between some of the steps there. Yes. Kind of yeah. in the middle. Yeah, it says so, the inhib inhibitors, though, yes, I think. That's what you're looking at, yeah. Exactly. So those are inhibitors. Um, so what does that mean? So we can see this step, for instance, between um, alpha-ketoglutaric acid and uh, succinic acid. I think I pronounced those correctly. Uh, like at the bottom of that citric acid cycle circle. And we can see, all right, so to make that conversion, this is not my test results, by the way. Uh, this is just uh, something I grabbed off the internet. Um, to make that conversion, we can see it requires nutrients. I think it actually requires more than that, but it at least requires those, magnesium B1, B2, B3. But also that conversion can be inhibited by uh, mercury, arsenic, and I actually can't remember what that stands for, SB, maybe look that up, Chrissy, but by those three poisons, basically. Um, and so... That's the other thing to understand that, you know, I talked earlier about lead. Uh, let's see, have we got lead here? Lead is PB. No, lead is not here. But again, <laughs> lead definitely does interfere with this. It's just, again, if we included everything in this this, this diagram, it would be far too complicated to understand. So that's why I picked a reasonably simple one. Um, but that's the point. Any of these poisons, any of these toxins, what, what is SB? SB is antimony. Antimony, thank you. Uh, any of these poisons can inhibit this uh, conversion of one thing to another, which can lead to fatigue, which can lead to a lack of the body being able to produce energy in this more efficient manage, uh, manner. Um, and so that can be the other problem. So, you know, number two in the rejuvenate blueprint is uh, the, the deficiency of building blocks, but number three is the excess of things, right? And, you know, an excess of things that are blatantly poisons, like those three, is the most obvious. Now, sometimes there's an excess of things which are not necessarily poisonous, but which can be in excess, like, you know, copper or iron or whatever. But just to keep it simple for a moment, uh, an excess of poisons will interfere in that process. So this is where I talked about this can be one of the other root causes. One of the other root causes of your fatigue may be that there is some poison or combination of poisons existing in your cellular matrix in your cellular system within the cell bathing the cell within the cellular substrate within the mitochondria itself whatever it might be and any combination of those which is preventing that that efficient production of energy or reducing the ability of your body to produce energy properly for any you know number of different reasons and this just let you know list a few heavy metals but you know we've talked about other things we've talked about um, you know, mycotoxins before. We've talked about how um, you know, omega-6s and their byproducts, which are, you know, partly aldehydes can get in the way of this process. There's loads of things which can get in the way of these process. And so that's the other thing we need to be aware of that could potentially be a cause. Now, the problem with toxins is, like the list of nutrients is quite long, like essential nutrients is like 50-ish that your body has to get from the outside that it can't make itself. Um, but you can test them most of them for, you know, $500-ish with a NutriVal. It's reasonably accurate, reasonably helpful. The amount of toxins that could be creating, um, uh, you know, fatigue problems is a lot more diverse and a lot more expensive to test for. So often you'll test maybe for some of the most common toxins, like the NutriVal does test for some of them. But you'd also look at, like markers that show that your body might be struggling to 
detoxify as well. And again, some of those markers are also in a Nutrival. This is like a sales picture of Nutrival. We don't make any money for this, by the way. Um, and you have to have but a But it's a brilliant test, let's be honest. <laughs> you have to have a doctor to order it. And, but, you know, it, it's just an example. Um, so, so, yeah, so testing all the nutrients is difficult, but testing all the toxins it could be is, you know, virtually impossible. But you can test for some of the most common, you know, the usual suspects, the most likely suspects. And again, in my case, that was helpful. Um, and you can start thinking about just reducing toxicity. I mean, it really helps to take it seriously, right? Maybe as it is now, maybe you're still smoking. Now, you think, well, who, who would smoke tobacco and watch a show like this? Well, I was surprised. I went to a Joe Dispenza event, where, which is kind of basically all people focus on doing this very rigorous meditation practice every day in order to heal themselves, usually of some serious issue. And then I was amazed at the amount of people who in the break weren't just going out and getting coffee and pastries, which I guess is normal, but were going out and smoking cigarettes. So I was like, ah, oh, okay. So, you know, some, like something like this, and again, I used to smoke cigarettes. I'm not sitting in judgment on anyone. I'm just pointing out the lack of congruence between the two goals. Um, but, you know, this can help. You go, ah, oh, okay. Especially if you do a test and you're like, oh, God, I'm really low in succinic acid and that is actually essential for energy production. And look at that. Look at what's getting in the way. Uh, mercury and arsenic. And, oh, those are both really high in cigarette smoke. Or they're really high in whatever thing that you might still be doing. It might just give you the motivation to actually think twice about those actions. Yeah, because the other part of this too is even if you are, I mean, that's step one and not taking in so many toxins, but then you also have to look at the other part of, you know, how well is your detoxification system working to be able to remove those things? So yes, you're limiting things coming in, but you also got to make sure the processes are working as well. Yeah, the limiting coming in, it's always better to focus on that. And, you know, we have a whole episode on that um, because, you know, it's, but, but as you say, you can, you can have got your intake down by 90% and you could have done that, I don't know, 10 years ago and you might still be struggling with toxicity because as you say, you may have a big backlog in your cells. And same with me, you know, none of that lead toxicity was recent exposure at all. You know, we've proven that. The problem is it lasts in your bones for, you know, 20 years on average. Um, and, but it's the same for actually a lot of these toxins. Uh, a lot, uh, all the fat soluble toxins, for instance, of which there's quite a few, uh, whether it's your xenoestrogens or your mycotoxins or whatever. Um, and might, you know, there's some things like mycoplastics. We don't know if they ever get detoxified or removed from the body. So uh, absolutely, it's it's also helping to support your body with uh, dealing with the backlog and seeing if your body's struggling with the backlog. So that's something that you can test relatively, you know, without an insane expense. And see Which if, test would that be? Uh, again, in the... Um, uh, well, there's a few. In fact, some of the, yeah, they're actually listed here at the bottom, <laughs> Chrissy. So uh, just around this electron transport chain, uh, there's lipid peroxides that indicates if your fats are being oxidized, which is damaged uh, by an excess of oxidation. The two above there, coenzyme Q10 and glutathione, uh, if they are low, that's more just a sign that your body is struggling to keep up with the oxidative backload. And the 8-OHDG there, is I know it's Dr. Miriam's favorite to just uh, see if the body is struggling to detoxify. There are others in the Nutrival, and then there's the more common ones just in a normal blood panel that your doctor might do, which are not very sensitive. But if you do have those raised, like your ALT, AST, GGT, for instance, like those can be indicators that your liver is struggling. Uh, even the uh, EGFR, if your kidney function is low, that can be an indication that you're yeah, your body's struggling with toxicity. So there's a few different things that that we have talked about in previous episodes. Um, but I want to move on if it's okay from toxins because we still have more. Um, so the next one I did already talk about. Um, so it's uh, hormones, right? When it comes to fatigue. Um, so I already talked about thyroid. That's the number one thing that I would focus on. Um, I already talked about the adrenals. If they are elevated and raised and if that ratio, like for instance, a cortisol to DHEA is raised, that is, you know, a sign that the adrenals are overactive, even though the cortisol isn't super high. Um, and then there's um, the sex hormones. Generally, if they're low, that's a sign that you're fatigued. But there is also, you know, insulin is a hormone. The pancreas is a, an endocrine gland. And I would also test for insulin. Uh, a lot of people 
talk about insulin resistance as being the root cause of all the chronic diseases these days. Again, I think that's oversimplified, but it does correlate with a lot. <laughs> so it's it's not a cheap test, unfortunately, compared to a blood sugar test, but it's worth looking into. Now, in terms of fatigue, we haven't got into blood sugar, but I guess now is really a time because ultimately the regulator of blood sugar is a hormone and we're, we're on step four, which is partly hormones. And so... Um, Balancing blood sugar is, a, is another very important element of fatigue. And if the fatigue is uh, like not consistent, but is up and down. So for instance, if you have a crash, you know, mid-afternoon is the most typical, you know, example. Or if you have a crash, if you haven't eaten, or if you have a crash just after you've eaten, all of that kind of stuff, that may indicate, again, there might be nothing wrong with your mitochondria, that might be an issue with blood sugar balance. And so that's definitely something that's worth looking into as well. There's a lot of advice related to that I would give, but it, I did a two-hour episode on it, <laughs> which is the uh, episode <laughs> hypoglycemia. So I would refer people to that episode to learn more about that. But that can definitely be a root cause of low energy as well. That needs to be addressed. It's related to the stuff I was talking about earlier, uh, because if you fast, if you don't eat when you wake up, for instance, for several hours, not only does that spike blood chemicals, uh, sorry, uh, adrenal chemicals in your blood uh, and in your body, but it also will um, temporarily drop blood sugar and then your body will use the stress chemicals in order to then raise the blood sugar. But as we said, the blood, sh the stress chemicals, especially if you've been running on them a long time, are not as stable and consistent and reliable to keep your energy up as just actual food being healthily digested, healthy food being healthily digested would be able to keep you on very stable and consistent energy. If you're running on adrenals, it the, you know, the energy tends to be more up and down. You have large amounts of blood sugar and then for energy fluctuation. So just like thyroid, blood sugar is a huge part of energy and fatigue and definitely should be focused on. But just like thyroid, I've already done a whole episode on it. So that's why I'm not like talking about it massively. But it's definitely one of those things that I would recommend that people watch the episode and focus on um, if they have fatigue, especially if their energy is, as I say, up and down, especially if they have crashes, mid-afternoon being the most classic time for it, and if they have sugar cravings and all of that kind of stuff that indicates that hypoglycemia and insulin is a big part of it. Um, and I think that's, you know, the main ones in terms of hormones I would focus on, hormones, neurotransmitters and peptides. Yeah, like those would be like the big ones when it comes to energy and fatigue. And so that brings us to lifestyle. Step five. Here <laughs> Step we go. Five. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the main one when it comes to fatigue, we did already address earlier, and that is sleep, right? Uh, you have to have enough sleep. Now, the problem is... Um, just like I said, there's a vicious circle with stress and CO2, there is a vicious circle with stress and sleep, which means you actually have to have, it's ironic and unfortunate and counterintuitive, but you have to have enough energy in order to relax, like relax your muscles. This is something that people um, don't realize. This is where chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia would go hand in hand, even though you'd think they're unrelated. So chronic fatigue, you know, chronic low energy, even extreme, just can't get out of bed, have to have someone do everything for you, that kind of stuff. Fibromyalgia is chronic pain everywhere in your body. And I'm not saying that it's always as simple as this, but definitely one component to it is, well, one component to it is if you have chronic fatigue, you're not producing energy efficiently, which means you're probably producing energy inefficiently to survive, which means that you're producing a lot more lactic acid as a byproduct. And acid building up in the muscles and tendons and tissues and all the rest of it causes pain. So that's one of the reasons. But one of the other reasons it causes pain, especially again if it's chronic and all over, is that it takes a certain amount of energy to relax. Relaxation actually requires energy. The, uh, you wouldn't the, think so. And no. that's what's so crazy. <laughs> it is. So my proof for that, this is the thing that really won me over this perception, is look at a corpse. A corpse has zero energy. Now, what happens when someone dies? Do they become all flaccid and like a big no, jelly? No, they call them a stiff for a reason. Right. They go into rigor mortis. It's the exact opposite. So it turns out that energy is actually required to relax a muscle um, 
not or you know not to tense it i mean energy is required for both processes i guess but what i'm saying is the default process if there is a lack of energy is tension not relaxation and so in order to sleep we have to be able to relax right so we have to be able to relax physically the muscles in our body and we also have to be able to relax our mind and when we are in a chronic stress state we tend to have problems with both of those things so you might be too physically tense to sleep you know, it shows up as uh, fidgeting and twitching and restless leg and all that kind of stuff that I know keeps a lot of people awake. And it will show up as, um, you know, racing mind, right? Not being able to calm yourself down. Um, and so, you know, I guess with that, I would go back more to the hormones and stuff, talking about that. Because uh, if you have enough progesterone and thyroid and all the rest of it, that probably is going to resolve that enough for you to be able to sleep. Um, but really the root, root cause is actually a uh, lack of energy. And so it's a bit of a vicious circle. And that's why doing things that just increase the level of stress chemicals, if you are fatigued, like fasting, like stimulants, and all the rest of it, um, um, are undesirable because they will then also interfere with your ability to sleep. With, oh, and even binging on sweets, if I'm picking on stuff, because that then imbalances the blood sugar. The blood sugar is imbalanced. It's also, you're much more likely to wake up in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep. Um, so whether it's trying to get to sleep or whether it's staying asleep, all the things that I've kind of warned against that raise stress um, will also interfere with sleep. So sleep is hugely important. Um, exercise is important for energy as well, but this is case by case. If you are fatigued, should you be forcing yourself to go to the gym and run or lift weights? Mm, not necessarily. Like that can actually uh, make things worse. Now it depends on the course. Um, if like overall exercise is very beneficial in the vast majority of cases, there's a huge amount of evidence for it. One of the ways that exercise is very beneficial is that it produces CO2 in the body. And so even if you are in top, CO2 intolerant, it will raise the level of CO2. Another way is that it gets the blood flow moving, gets the lymph moving, it gets nutrients to the cells, it gets uh, waste products away from the cells. Um, and of course, there's the if you're doing outside, you're getting sunlight, which in many cases, not always is beneficial. You're getting fresh air, which in many cases, not always is beneficial. You know, um, so there's a lot of potential benefits to exercise. Uh, but I will say if you are fatigued, you need to do an amount that does not leave you more fatigued afterwards. And that is the trick. And so for someone of severe chronic fatigue, that may just be getting out of bed and walking around their bedroom for 10 seconds. You know, for someone who is doing very well, it may be doing, you know, two hours of intense cardio and weight training in the gym and not free. You know, it's whatever is that level for you, which is that leaves you feeling not more fatigued afterwards is really the right amount of exercise. And this assumes that you're doing everything right. So, you know, that you're not letting your blood sugar crash with your exercise, for instance, all that kind of stuff that we've talked about. Um, but assuming you're exercising in the right way, uh, which you should be doing if you're exercising, then making sure that it's not fatiguing you afterwards. Uh, it should be energizing and it, it should be invigorating because it raises stress chemicals, exercise. You know, I'm not saying not to exercise, but it does do that. It has so many other benefits. I think that's fine that it raises those stress chemicals. But if anything, afterwards, you should be energized, not fatigued. And so fatigue after exercise is the you know, obvious indicator that you've overdone it. Another one is if it drops your temperature. You know, so I have this with clients. Um, we, you know, we want our metabolism if we're fatigued, we want to try and speed up our metabolism. There are maybe cases where we don't want to speed up our metabolism, where we want to slow it down, like if we're in a position of lack of food, for instance, um, or for whatever other reason, obscure reason. <laughs> but uh, there are a, a time when we definitely want to speed up the metabolism, which is what is metabolism? Just the rate at which this whole process happens, that we've got our graphic here, the rate at which energy is produced, the rate at which mitochondria produce energy is increased if we're speeding up our metabolism. That's what that means. And so we want to increase that. And so the obvious sign of that is body temperature. And so uh, any action that you take that um, lowers body temperature. Now, having said that, 
a lot of people's temperature drops after eating. That's because their temperature They're is... They're in a stress state, correct? Yeah, exactly. The temperature is artificially elevated by stress chemicals, specifically cortisol, is my understanding. And then when they eat, the stress chemicals go down after eating, always, because that's required to, to digest the food. And so it may seem like the temperature drops. So that's not 100% reliable, but with exercise, I find it is. So, you know, if you're not sure if you're overdoing it, you can take your temperature... Uh, before like an hour before take it an hour or two afterwards if it's dropped and you're doing everything else right you know not starving yourself then that means you've overdone it probably uh if anything you know exercise should increase metabolism a lot of people say that it does so if the temperature goes up afterwards again an hour or two later because immediately afterwards you might still be on the stress chemicals but an hour or two afterwards you shouldn't be so if it goes up afterwards congratulations you've increased your metabolism by exercising carry on doing that <laughs> but if it drops you've overdone it that would be my understanding with exercise um now with energy as well in terms of lifestyle stuff light plays a huge part in that so um blue light earlier in the day will increase the stress chemicals um but you know this is the right way of increasing stress chemicals would be in my uh, my understanding. Um, probably more relevant to me, though, would be uh, not having blue light at the end of the day and, you know, having more red light at the end of the day. So that means uh, I yeah, you'll see this if, uh, if you come to my house again before I move, Chrissy, but I've replaced like all the light bulbs in my house, except for in here, because it is weird for the cameras with um, like red, like uh genuinely full spectrum bulbs that you can switch them and then they kind of go like uh, red and yellow light only no blue light um so you can kind of change it at, at night um now that's me because i don't like wearing glasses um but for a lot of people into health stuff and especially people with fatigue stuff the much simpler way and less expensive way is to just get some of those blue blocking glasses uh and wear those once the sun has set so that you don't have that blue light coming in. That's very important as well. And then red light, like red light uh, therapy, again, preferably you're talking about the sun uh, or even like an open fire. But a lot of people, you know, people these days don't have access to either, especially in England and <laughs> these kind of climates. So then um, uh, getting like a red light device, red light absolutely does stimulate um, increased mitochondrial energy production. It's very effective for that. And so, you know, that's, I don't know if, I don't know whether to put that as nutrient or lifestyle. I kind of, maybe I'll flip on that sometimes. Is it a nutrient? Is it a building block or is it lifestyle? Maybe it should be of nutrients because it kind of is a nutrient, red light. Uh, but anyway, red light, um, I'd see it as more as lifestyle because in practice it seems to be lifestyle. Uh, getting more red light in by getting actual sunlight or by kind of supplementing with red light. Uh, is a very important part of that process as well. And it's helpful for the production of energy. It speeds up the metabolism. It's also helpful for speeding up the excretion from the cell of a lot of those toxins that get in the way. And so some people feel worse doing red light. Unfortunately, I was one of them when I did high intensity, like large doses, because it was moving too much toxins out of my cells into my blood, which was already having too much toxins. Um, but so if, if you have that effect from red light, then reduce or stop, but for everyone else who their main problem isn't large amounts of toxins in their cells, uh, but who do have an issue of fatigue, it's fantastic. And I think that probably is, you know, the majority of people. So big fan of red light, big fan of blocking blue light at night. And I'm sure there's some light stuffing I missed, but I think those are like the key ones. So I'll move on to the next thing. <laughs> if that's okay. If I missed any, you want to talk about Chrissy? No, I think those are all really good points. Just really going through the lifestyle. I mean, like there's so much with lifestyle, you know, there's, there's lots. So I uh, know I think it's time we can go ahead and move on to step six. Okay. So number six is, um, infections, right now, acute infections can sometimes lead to chronic fatigue. Uh, most famously is, uh, you know, Epstein-Barr type of herpes, herpes virus that's often blamed on fatigue. Uh, I think justifiably so in some cases, although, I'm always wary. I see a lot of people who have been diagnosed with it without any tests to actually prove it. It's just like some person's opinion. So I'm not a fan of that. Uh, and I think it's often, you know, 
misleading and inaccurate but of course it is a thing it is absolutely a thing people will get this viral disease and then afterwards they just have this fatigue that they can't shift and so that's because the viruses will have the same effect just in the way that i described that poisons heavy metals and all the rest will uh, affect the mitochondria's ability to produce energy so will viruses and viruses will um you know potentially de uh, create that semi-permanent effect in the cell another one famously is lyme disease right as well where there's an initial bacterial infection but there seems to be like a viral component which creates this fatigue long term and then that needs to be addressed i'm not an expert in the viral stuff i would probably want to bring in someone who's an expert to really discuss that at some point to interview them uh, but i want to acknowledge that's definitely one the one that i am more familiar with and aware of is um, the other types of infections so you know bacterial infections uh chronic infections absolutely can create fatigue uh, especially if they affect the digestive or respiratory systems because of course those are both key to energy production like we talked about um now any you know even if it's a skin infection or whatever it will still create a problem indirectly because um it can uh cause the immune system to be in a more pro-inflammatory state which will potentially um, cause it to uh, downregulate and interfere with energy production in all kinds of ways. I would say more importantly, though, with all infections is infections create toxins. And so it's back to that issue. And then those toxins, like endotoxin, the most famous one created by bacteria in the gut, even the so-called commensal ones, which are supposed to be harmless, they, a lot of them still produce endotoxin. And still, you know, a certain amount gets into the blood and still it has a very detrimental effect on all kinds of things, including the mitochondrial energy production. So the more you can limit the level, and I say level because sometimes it's not possible to completely get rid of them, like in the case of commensal bacteria, back to your question earlier, Chrissy, but the more we can reduce that level of any bacteria which is creating poisons which the body has to deal with the better it's going to be from an energy point of view and especially if it's interfering with respiration or most commonly digestion right like that has to be resolved and again i think we've done a whole episode on that so i won't get into that <laughs> here but um if you feel worse after eating if you feel lower energy after eating then that's not something to go oh well therefore i'm just going to fast and ignore that that's something to go into well what's wrong <laughs> why is that the case that's not natural that's not normal and i say this again i always i hope i whenever i'm talking this way like it's maybe i'm judging someone it's i'm always talking about myself i because i was that person i was like uh it's just the way it is i just feel worse when i eat i suppose that's just normal i just feel more tired and and i ignored it for years and years and years and then it ended up becoming a more serious problem so uh, you know if if you have that please don't think it's normal it is something to address like i wish i'd have done earlier um and yeah i suppose that's it for chronic infections unless you have any questions yeah no i don't i because as well i mean we've done a, a episode on that as well i think it's, it's it's one of those things to take into consideration that you may not have thought might be the issue and so that's why this step is very, it's a good one to look at in case you're thinking, gosh, I, I've gone through everything else. I just don't know. So it's another one to uncover and look under the hood. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. And the last is emotional things. So I don't know if we've done a full episode on this, Chrissy. I know we recorded one just audio and then we never put it out. Maybe we should put that one out. Um, so again, I won't go into this in detail because it's a big topic, but I talked earlier about like I, I had observed a certain psychological profile in terms of people who are fatigued or chronic fatigue. Um, so I talked about the good side earlier, which is absolutely there, although hmm, I suppose <laughs> pushing yourself until you collapse is, but it's 100% well-meaning, let's just say that. But another thing I have noticed psychology belief-wise with people, and this is I think more something that develops once they have fatigue, is like this victim consciousness. Um, it's very much understandable. It's like an I can't kind of feeling and it's not possible. And um, like a lot of attachment to a story about why life is hard and it's unfair and all of this kind of stuff. And it's completely understandable. Um, being in a energy, being in a state of severe energy depletion is like being in a state of severe poverty. 
but actually worse, I would say, having experienced both. Um, because with poverty, you can kind of, you can work to earn money. Uh, you can, you know, someone can charitably give you some money. You can steal some money. Like there's a lot of ways to get money. Um, <laughs> There's not a There's lot not of ways a, to no. get energy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we've got a plug that we can just charge up and, and however and replenish. No, it's it's something different entirely. Yeah. So the victim mentality does totally make sense, like feeling like you are hard done by and you know, you you've drawn a, the short straw in life and all the rest of it. It, it. it is entirely understandable. The problem is it can become a self fulfilling prophecy where you kind of believe that um you're in this bad position and then what I observed is unfortunate and this happens with people in a victim mentality if you try and offer them uh solutions or not just me when when they're offered solutions in general or things that might be solutions there's like oh that's not gonna work and I can't do it and all of that kind of stuff so I think there is that psychological component which can definitely as I said usually the thing that leads the f it, it's all around the issue of I can I can't and I do recommend people watch our um, episode on this, the um, the five types, uh, if you can link to the, that. To yeah, the see. personality characteristics, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the personality that really relates to fatigue that I see is the, uh, the oral type or the merging type, and especially the compensated oral. And so they have this pattern where um, they kind of have a lot of needs that they ignore in themselves, and they kind of go around like helping everyone else with their needs. And so they're the classic helper, rescuer kind of person, um, whether, you know, rescuing animals or sick people or old people or children or whatever it might be that, you know, they're always looking after someone else, often someone weaker than themselves or helpless or whatever. And again, you know, highly, what would society be without those people? I'm so, you know, I, I love them and appreciate them. But... The problem for them is they're looking after everyone else's needs and usually ignoring their own needs. And this is, you know, forget about even psychological needs, like the need for fulfillment or something. I'm talking about the need for sleep, food, you know, like basic stuff um, until they push themselves to like be really exhausted and really depleted. And th so first of all, it's I can, right? And if someone says you should take it easy, you need a break, it's like, oh, no, I can do it, I can do it. Like So they have this kind of, as I said, super, superhero complex. And then they crash. And then they kind of go into this, you know, which often perceived from the outside as depressive state. Although, as I said, I, I believe it is real. You know, there's a real lack of mitochondrial energy because they really have pushed themselves way too hard and really have depleted themselves. Um, and then it's like, oh, I can't. You know, I can't do anything. I, and... And maybe there's a bit of resentment, like, oh, I look, I look after everyone else. No one's looking after me, all of this kind of stuff. And so part of healing in that case, if that is the root of your fatigue, and I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying consider it, is um, also healing that psychological thing, you know? And usually the root of it is uh, having parents that for whatever reason, maybe they were totally well-meaning and, you know, circumstantial, but they they left you feeling like, your needs were not fulfilled and they left you feeling like maybe your needs were not important and so all that your needs were wrong like you know you shouldn't have needs and again this can be well-meaning parents who you know have to work long hours or there's many other brothers and sisters and whatever other family members that took precedence and for whatever reason your needs were not important or you felt like they were not important and then that is kind of a complex that you carry out for the rest of your life. They say either it's just like neediness, like you're just a needy person and everyone else <laughs> sees you as an easy person. But as I say, the more common thing that leads to fatigue is where a person goes the other way. They're like, okay, so I don't have any needs. And then they, they push themselves really hard looking after everyone else until they collapse. So that's the psychology that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> you're smiling Chrissy so somebody you recognize in people around you or well it's just one of those things you can see it you know they go 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 until they have nothing left and then they collapse and then they're like okay finally they could pull themselves up and go 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 again and you know and always putting everybody else first and never themselves not really fully understanding that in order to truly help others that the, the first they really need to take care of themselves so they can show up in the best way possible for others 
Mm. And I'd say I would have that with, I had this pattern kind of without the good side, I think. Like I was just like really pushing myself really, really hard. Like, you know, back when I used to be a chef, I was working all these long hours and like way beyond. And I mean, I was, I guess I was preparing people food all day. So I was kind of helping others, but it, it wasn't like, you know, the forefront of my mind to help people. It was more unconscious, um, I guess, but I just completely didn't look after my own needs at all and was completely oblivious to them and whatever. Um, and so that can happen. It, it's not always looking after people, although that's, you know, the most common, but it could be like working really hard to, you know, uh, get promotion or build a business or whatever it can be, you know, it can manifest in those ways as well, potentially, but whatever it's that pattern of pushing yourself way beyond your own limits, ignoring your own limits, pretending you don't have limits and then crashing and going back and forward between them. That's, that's, you know, the, I guess the unifying theme of the, um, of the pattern. So that's something to look at. That's something to be aware of because I've had experience of you help. And these people are not always uh, resistant to helpful advice. Sometimes they take it gl gladly and joyfully. But then what happens is as soon as they do and they start feeling better, they start pushing themselves too hard again <laughs> until exactly. they're right back in bed <laughs> fatigued. Um, so that's the other potential, you know, issue to be aware of. So like the, I guess my conclusion is looking at what is it in you that feels like you have to ignore your own needs and push yourself far beyond your own limits till the point that you're fatigued again. And as I said, the clue would be, um, you know, maybe feeling like you're not enough, that you don't deserve love, you don't deserve to have your needs met or whatever. And that's usually the thing that has to be looked at and addressed. Beautiful. I mean, and I'm so glad that this is um, step seven is part of the rejuvenation blueprint because many people don't understand that how big of a component this is. Um, and I know we'll go, we've go. we gone into the deeper into that, into the episode, uh, um, our deeper episode in Rejuvenation Blueprint. So do check that out and with your book coming up. So that'll be really great. This is a wonderful walkthrough on fatigue through the blueprint. So I'm really glad that we've done that. So we can also bring that practical side to everybody as they're listening so that they can identify, okay, what area potentially is this fatigue really uh, coming from? As you say, where's the root cause emanating from? Yeah, yeah, exactly. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. This is becoming more in common and fatigue is becoming more common these days. Um, so because it is, I really think, yeah, let's bring forth, you know, what are the practical things, practical steps that people can take to really address this? Okay. So first of all, Everything we just covered, you, you're you going to want to consider. So I would look into genetics, see if any of the root factors that we've talked about could play a part in it, obviously, with something like genetic insights. Um, now, let's go back to nutrients, because there's some I skipped over, like if we go back to our diagram here, that there's actually some very interesting research that says it helps with fatigue. Now, before I go into the kind of advanced stuff, let me just talk about the basics a little bit more. So again... If you have a magnesium deficiency, if you have a B vitamin deficiency, if you have an iron deficiency, all of that kind of stuff, and other stuff that's maybe on not on this list, but zinc is another one I see quite commonly, for instance, people with fatigue, that has to be addressed first, and it's much cheaper and easier, and you know you might be able to get it from food, all of that kind of stuff. Fantastic. So do that. Uh, definitely the blood sugar thing. Um, now, you know you can see you can make energy from fat, carbohydrate, or protein. Um, some people are better having more of their energy coming from fat. Some people are better having more of their energy from carbohydrates. I know this is very contentious. Um, you know, so 
I know some people watching this are very firmly on one side or the other. That's fine. If it works for you and everyone you know to only do one way, that's great. Um, but, you know, find out the thing that is right for you that works for you. Uh, again, in Genetic Insights, we have our carbohydrate report, which talks about this. Are you someone who is adapted to having large amounts of carbohydrate or are you someone maybe who's more hunter-gatherer who's more adapted to getting their calories from fats? I can tell you for me, um, it's from fats. It, it says it in my genetics. It says it in my Nutriva report. And it even said it in my mitochondria report that my body was better at converting energy, uh, creating ATP from fat than carbohydrate. So that's me, but everyone is different. And plenty of people, you know, they do better with carbohydrates. Um, and so finding out which of those is a better fuel for you is very important as well. And doing all the stuff I talked about in the blood sugar episode, so not having carbs on their own because it's going to spike and crash your blood sugar, not having carbohydrate or fat without protein because uh, it helps to balance your blood sugar. All of that kind of stuff is very important. But um, let's assume that you've dealt with all that basic stuff. Is there anything more advanced? So, yeah, there's a couple of things. One of the things, so if we see in this... Um, chart here underneath carbohydrates there's uh, pyruvic acid and then uh, you know acetyl coa so some people with fatigue do better when they supplement with pyruvate so uh, there's a supplement you can buy called calcium pyruvate and so this is a more uh, what's the word direct precursor to energy that you can try and especially if you get one of these reports back and it shows that you are low in pyruvate well First thing you want to look at is magnesium, because as you can see, that is required for the conversion of carbohydrate to pyruvate. But again, I'm assuming that you're doing all that basic stuff. If you're still fatigued, these are some of the things you can try, right? So pyruvate is one of the things that you can try. Um, malic acid is also one of the things that you can try. This is available in the form of magnesium malate. So this is magnesium bound to malic acid. And this is actually often considered to be the type of magnesium that is good for energy, good for the muscles, uh, like giving energy to the muscles, good for ATP production. So you're probably going to be taking some kind of magnesium. It's one of the few things that everyone should be supplementing. So if you're low in energy and you haven't got any particular reason to have a different type of magnesium, then why not go for magnesium malate? <laughs> because that also you know, is a donor to this particular cycle, as you can see. Two other things that you can see in the citric acid cycle, which you might want to consider donating, both of which can be very effective for chronic fatigue, are uh, succinic acid and oxaloacetic acid. Um, I have tried both. In my case, though, I had actually had high levels of succinic acid in my um, in my uh, in my Nutrival, so that may be why it didn't really have much effect. So this is uh, like a Russian chronic fatigue cure. Uh, they they will sell it over there. It's pretty cheap. They include it in you know just like basic supplements. Um, I've seen it in a few Western supplements, but it's not that common. Uh, but there is a lot of evidence to show, mainly Russian research, that uh, succinic acid is extremely effective for fatigue for fatigue it's like a direct donor to this whole cycle and for whatever reason unlike citric acid um i won't go into the complexity of it because i don't actually understand it enough in the case of succinic acid i've just seen the studies that show that it definitely works um so that's something to consider um you can also see that oxaloacetic acid so that's one that i'm trying at the moment because as i said of that low mitochondrial function so oxaloacetic acid um, in high doses is uh, something that is considered to be, you know, a chronic fatigue um, treatment. Uh, they have like a low dose version, which is kind of available to everyone. I think they sell it as like something that reduces PMS symptoms. That's one of the brandings for it. Another one is just like an energy support. But they also sell a very high dose version, which is supposed to be only used under medical supervision, although they don't enforce that. And that's something that... Um, they have studies around that it has been shown to significantly improve symptoms of chronic fatigue. And I thought it was interesting because in that one, they're like often fatigue is like self-reported. It's like, do you feel more energy or rate it on a scale of one to 10? But one of these studies, what they actually did is they put um, a thing on them that like recorded their movements and they found that their actual movement throughout the day increased by like whatever it was, 40% or something like that. So it's like a very, again, as we talked earlier, if you have energy, you want to move, 
So, you know, by giving this oxaloacetic acid, people actually wanted to move more and were able to move more. And we're talking about, you know, chronic fatigue, right? People who literally can't get out of bed. So if it's powerful enough to increase energy in those kind of people, um, is it going to help with normal people uh, or people who are not maybe severely chronically fatigued? There's not much research on it, but it's something that if you're into improving your energy, it's something to consider. So oxaloacetic acid... Uh, I mean, we could do a whole episode on it, and yeah, we're out of time really. Uh, so maybe we will if there's demand for it. But you know, in a nutshell, basically, it gives that. Di- despite the way it kind of looks in this diagram, it actually gives this direct donation uh, to then go into the electron transport chain. So it's like almost at the end of the cycle of uh, energy production. It also helps to uh, recycle. Um, uh, God, what is it? Is it citric acid? Is it lactic acid? It, it helps to recycle one of the waste pro, pro, uh, products of this system and turn it back into, uh, I think, acetyl-CoA, like a, a useful substrate for energy. Uh, so it's an interesting thing. I won't, uh, I, as I didn't research particularly before this episode about only a, <laughs> oxaloacetic acid, so I'm not doing it justice, but you can easily look it up yourself um, and look into uh, the research on it. Now, you can also see at the bottom there, coenzyme Q10 and glutathione. Glutathione, I wouldn't really take, you know, unless you need it to reduce uh, oxidative stress, but coenzyme Q10 is an interesting one. Uh, because it is a direct supporter of the energy production. And so a lot of people with fatigue, coenzyme Q10 is recommended. I do recommend it. Um, it's a, it is an antioxidant, but it's also uh, you know, an essential part of that energy production system. Another one uh, is PQQ that I've talked about before. This particular type of quinone, um, it not only supports mitochondrial energy production, but it even supports mitogenesis, which is the uh, creation of more mitochondria. Now, on the subject of creation of more mitochondria, um, you might also want to try something that does the opposite. So there's something called mitophagy, which is where it actually reduces and breaks down mitochondria. Why is that something that you'd be interested in if you're in, interested in increasing energy? Because um, it, the problem may be not that you don't have enough mitochondria, but the ones that you do have are dysfunctional. And so there's this thing called autophagy, which is the just the breakdown of your cells. And mitophagy is the breakdown of mitochondria within the cells. So there's two things out there that are well known for this that I'm aware of. One of them is called spermidine, which is a uh, wheat germ extract, I believe. And another one is called, um, um, oh God, I can't remember how to pronounce it. Uh, I know that the brand name for it is MitoPure. It's like uh, or, or relaxing a or something like that um, so both of those are very interesting for uh, mitophagy they have all kinds of other benefits again if you want to look into them i realize i'm not doing any of these justice i'm just giving you a bunch of stuff that you can look into yourself if you uh if you're interested in this but it's been shown to be anti-aging and um you know helping with uh mitochondrial function all the rest of it so those are another couple of things that you may want to look into and that you may want to consider. Now, what about methylene blue, Elwin? Isn't that a donor to the electron transport chain? Um, It is, and you may want to use it for that reason. I am a little bit more suspicious of methylene blue these days. Uh, I stopped using it um, and have done for quite a while now. I think that like with so many of these things, it's something that can be beneficial, but can be overdone. And so I would caution those who are thinking of using it or already using it for energy, um, that if it's working for you, great. But just like I said earlier, stimulants or coffee, um, try not having it and see it's how re- you feel. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, as we've talked about in other episodes when you're ingesting something and it makes you feel better it could be doing that because not saying it's a toxin but it's taking away or masking as you were saying earlier certain things yeah and the masking i guess is not the end of the world if it's really helping so i can see people like rejecting that objection um my concern with it more is the Okay, because you could say the same about oxaloacetic acid, you know, let's say you take it, it works, your fatigue goes down, great. If you stop taking it after a few days, your fatigue may come back to some degree. 
But what I'm concerned about with methylene blue is not so much only that, it's that people seem to have real withdrawal symptoms from it. And they seem to have real, um, like feeling significantly worse and not just going back to how you were before, but actually way worse than before. So that's really more what I'm concerned about. And so same with all this stuff, PQQ, CoQ10, all the rest of it, you could say if it's working and you stop taking it, it is possible you're going to go back to not feeling as good again. But I would say a beneficial thing is, let's say your energy was a two, you do, you take oxaloacetic acid for a few months, you stop, yeah, sorry, you got it up to a seven, great, you stop, maybe you're back down to a four or a five, right? Like, or even a but three. There, you, yeah, you've had some movement in the right direction. Exactly. So that's what I, you know, that's probably... Uh, Maybe not best case scenario, but a more realistic best case for someone with, you know, fairly severe fatigue that they, you know, that these things maybe haven't resolved it. I mean, ideally, of course, they would, but, you know, often that's very difficult to resolve fatigue, unfortunately, but they've at least moved in the right direction. What I am more concerned about is things that if you stop, you actually feel worse than before. And unfortunately, I've seen more and more anecdotal evidence and people saying that that is the case for them. So that's why... Uh, I don't recommend nepheline blue anymore. Anything that can potentially now, not never. And yes, I realise it's life eight saving therapy that every uh, you know emergency room has and all the rest of it. I'm not saying it's universally bad by any means, but I'm saying like daily use over a long period of time, especially in high doses, uh, I am more you know definitely wary of. Okay, all right. Those are all really great points, Owen. Fantastic for going over those practical things. Yeah, and so those are just some kind of next level things um, that you know people may not have heard of. Um, one other thing that I'll just talk about in the subject of fatigue, of course, which I think I so I should have said this earlier, but kind of in the hormone and neurotransmitter category. So often the experience of energy comes from dopamine, and so you may have perfectly good mitochondrial function, and you may feel. What you're experiencing as fatigue, it may not be a lack of energy, it may just be more like a motivation. So that's something to look into as well. And we have a full episode on dopamine and what it is and how to increase it and all the rest of it. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to that as well. But again, if you have fatigue, where would I start? Okay, very quick recap. Nutrients, is there anything you're low on, right? Toxins, are there signs that your body is struggling with toxins? If so, let's look for some of the most common ones and see if they're high. Hormones. Let's look at thyroid, let's look at blood sugar, let's look at adrenals, let's look at sex hormones. Do they need optimizing? Lifestyle, let's look at sleep, let's look at movement, let's look at light exposure, um, you know, as, as some of the basics. Let's look, do, we, do you have a chronic infection? And then probably of all of that, you feel either it's not it or it's in hand, maybe you'll want to look at the psychology of what's going on and... Do you tend to push yourself really hard until you're, you know, utterly exhausted and all the rest of it? And what is behind that? Um, that would be, you know, really the the bottom line. And if you feel overwhelmed by that, I know I've dealt with enough for T people to know what they're probably going to say about this. Oh, Owen, I couldn't follow that. It was too much information. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> all the rest of it. It's like, I understand. Just listen to a bit at a time, maybe. Maybe just one of the steps at a time and then spend a while thinking about it and go, okay. Does this apply to me? What can I do about this? What can I test? What are some obvious things that I can do straight away? What's an obvious thing I can do straight away with, you know, food? I, I can make sure I don't skip breakfast or I can make sure I take some magnesium, whatever it might be. What's an obvious thing I can do about toxicity? Well, I know this is bad for me and I do it anyway. I know this is for the toxins and I do it anyway. Maybe I should stop that, you know, like... <laughs> um, what can I do about, uh, you know, the hormones? Uh, let me just check the few basic ones like thyroid and see if that might be it. Like, just just start with, like, the basics. I'm trying to give you everything you need because the point of these episodes is maybe not complete guides, but a complete start, I guess, to everything that you might need. Um, but, yeah, take it in bite-sized chunks if that was overwhelming, if you are suffering with a lot of fatigue. Really great, really fantastic. I love that you're giving everybody a starting point, which is fan, which is wonder wonderful. It just really is, because it's a guide as well, because sometimes people can be like, I'm so overwhelmed, I don't even know where to start, so I can't even begin. Yeah, um, I know we uh, haven't had, I know we're coming to the end, but I just wanted to quickly touch on what about long COVID and, and proper chronic fatigue that's, just, that's out there? Do you want, have any points or things that you'd like to share with our listeners on those things? 
I don't think there's anything additional for chronic fatigue. I mean, everything I talked about is relevant for chronic fatigue, I would say. And, you know, we gave an example of succinic acid and oxaloacetic acid and, you know, what I'm aware of as cutting edge chronic fatigue treatments that are currently being researched and tried. Um, but in terms of long COVID, I would say, I had a question about this in the comments recently. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, first of all. Um, but if there is a fatigue component to it, I would say look at everything that we've talked about. The only thing I would add is that there may be a spike issue, right? So the one thing that I would add on top of this is I would definitely use natokinase. I would use natokinase anyway in most cases um, at some dose because it is so helpful at preventing the formation of blood clots, um, which is... Uh, sorry, excessive blood clots. Now, <laughs> because it's so effective at that, that's why uh, you don't want to overdo it either. So, uh, but like a lot, like one capsule every other day of a low dose natokinase is going to be safe for anyone who is not already taking some kind of blood thinning medication or something like that. So definitely check it with your doctor. Um, for people who do, you know, have a tendency for blood clotting and all the rest of it, which, you know, a lot of people do. And it's something you can see in your, your platelets, for instance, when you, um, when you uh, have a blood test, uh, a lot of people do well with more. Uh, so maybe one capsule a day, two capsules a day, something like that. Now, if you have long COVID, if you have a spike protein issue, I can't go into it any more than that because we're on YouTube. Um, there for whatever reason, then I would recommend taking natokinase, maybe taking bromelain as well. Uh, so these are enzymes which break down that protein because that could be at the root of the fatigue is that because of the virus or whatever else, um, you have this situation where your immune system is re reacting to something and immune system reactions that are strong absolutely can lead to you know a, a situation of reduced mitochondrial function and fatigue as well so um, that would be the only thing that i would say in addition to everything we've already talked about um with long covid uh i don't think uh that yeah i'll, I'll leave it there Brilliant information, Owen. I'm really glad that we did this episode on fatigue because it is something that is so widespread today. Um, before we close, I know we spent a lot of time, so we'll be um, finishing here. Any final thoughts for our listeners today? Yeah, check out the book, The Rejuvenate Blueprint. Um, uh, if you go to rejuvenateblueprint.com, it might still be redirecting to my old site, but at some point it will be going to my new site. So uh, have a look at that. Uh, check out the book, The Rejuvenation uh, the rejuvenate blueprint and remember to leave comments on youtube i do always check comments on youtube i'm not very active in the other social things other than maybe x as well x is the other place that you can reach me if you would like to um and i you know i'd love to hear from you i'd love to hear your feedback and of course as i said this is something i am certainly not optimal in so by all means if i'm missing anything if you think there's something important in the area of mitochondrial functioning specifically let me know right uh, i i'd love to hear it and also if you've had success uh doing anything that i've talked about or anything else then let us know let's kind of uh what's the word crowds crowdsource these solutions together i'm only sharing everything that i've come across um but i'd love to hear your take too as always, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you being here. Please let us know if there are any topics that you want us to discuss, investigate, or look at. We'd be happy to do so, so leave those in the comments. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss an episode, and we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode, and one of the ones I'd recommend is just here, if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.